Titan spacecraft did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. You know Flat Earthers, I guarantee it. But you don't know who they are because they're afraid of talking about it. This is not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system. Hello and welcome to the 68th Annual Subliminal Deception Podcast, your weekly dose of conspiracy theory bullshit. My name is Cody, and I'm joined by my pal Phil. How are you? Doing good, buddy. How about yourself? Not doing too bad. Enjoyed a nice little weekend. I finally visited my parents after not seeing them for whew, four months now, so uh, that was nice. And uh, yeah, that was my uh, that was my excitement of my <laughs> week. How was your week been? That sounds good going down to the exciting state of Iowa. I uh I mostly just hung out inside. Uh I went out a few times. You know, it's hot as shit, so trying to stay in the AC. You know what's weird? Obviously, you grow up there as well. In Minnesota, we haven't had that bad of storms, but we just happened to go down there and there's like this crazy goddamn wind thunderstorm that happened there in like uh a bunch of the corn was like bent sideways from how strong the wind was and stuff. I don't really? know what, yeah, I don't know what is going on in, in Iowa. If it's like the new tornado alley or something, but it's just really weird. Yeah. I remember when we were kids, tornadoes didn't really happen that much around there, but like listening to the news, it sounds like they get a lot worse shit now. Probably just global warming, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know what it is. It's fucking weird. That's what I keep saying. You always had like, the threat of a tornado warning or whatever, but they never actually really happened. But now they've been like actually touching ground there, which is really weird for Iowa. But uh yeah, and in Minnesota, I think last week, actually, like southern Minnesota, a tornado like ravaged a town and killed one person, I think. Oh, shit. I didn't hear about that. Yeah, I was. uh That's very weird for Minnesota. But uh but anyway, Phil, you said you wanted to talk about. The AAA company known as Best Buy. Yeah, so I got a couple different gripes. I've been uh, in the market for, to get a new, either like a computer or a laptop. And I went to a few different places uh, that were actually open. One of those places, obviously, like you just said, Best Buy. The first place I went to just to see what they had was actually Walmart. And let me tell you, it was about 110 fucking degrees outside. They need to extend those awnings for the people waiting in line to get into Walmart because I waited about 15 to 20 minutes outside of the store to get in just standing in the hot ass sun. But I, I don't understand why I don't just let everybody come in at once since we're all wearing masks, but Best Buy, I went, so they actually opened their stores back up. Like you could actually walk in now and go look around. I think Best Buy has been dying a slow death. Pretty much. Well, so I went in there to go look at desktops and the laptops and shit. I went to the electronics department. They had absolutely no desktops, laptops, computer monitors, everything that they usually put underneath the sh underneath the display. Nothing. They had absolutely nothing in there. I asked them about it. They claimed that they sold out entirely uh, while they were shut down. Problem is, everything that was up high, the, s the shelves were completely full. So basically, they just took all of their inventory out and brought it to the warehouse. When I asked about like what computers they had there, they told me just to go online and order it there and have them bring it to the store for pickup. Basically, the store is now might as well be like one of those mall kiosks <laughs> where you just kind of like look at shit and can't buy anything. Hey, I'm gonna I'm just gonna def be the devil's advocate here because uh, while everybody has been quarantined and everything, I don't know if you've looked on Amazon even, which we shouldn't even be supporting, but. You can't buy. We shouldn't be supporting Best Buy either. Probably but. not. But people were buying shit to entertain themselves while the quarantine was going on. Uh, so I wouldn't doubt if they sold out of computers because people are going to use those to entertain themselves. Nintendo Switches, don't even think about it. You're never getting one of them again until this shit's over with because so many people were buying them to play while they're at home. I can only imagine DS's. Uh, I think. PlayStation 4s had a shortage. 
Uh, so I wouldn't doubt if that actually happened. Yeah, the problem is, though, even the shitty computers and laptops that nobody buys, even all of those were gone from underneath the shelves. So well, I, I think mean, that's I- why I think I think that's they grabbed them out of there. But I will say they also they didn't have any even behind like the little lock cases. Uh, they did. They barely had any Xboxes, PS4s, and there were no switches there. So, oh, yeah, you're you're not. It's impossible to get a goddamn switch. You are not getting a switch right now. But uh, I, I don't know. Like, I've been trying to get nicer microphone stands for our little studio here for mm. three months now. Can't do it. They're always sold out. You just can't do it. Uh, so many people, I think, during quarantine started up their own podcast. Even yeah. getting uh, microphone equipment is hard to come by because it's all sold out everywhere. It's yeah, really I was weird. looking for a I was looking for a stand for my uh, I have a a Yeti microphone. I was looking for a stand for that, and they were all sold out. They said that everyone basically you can't find one right now for the Yeti. They're no. just completely gone. No, I'm telling you, man. A lot of people started podcasts during the quarantine. People are just looking for ways to entertain themselves. Obviously. Yeah, I'm sure most of them are pretty much just pod faded out. <laughs> just one or two episodes, then they tried to see what was on Netflix or something. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, a podcasting, you kind of have to uh, ride, ride or die with it. Yeah, definitely. I also wanted to say, while uh, in between recording this episode and the previous episode, something pretty big in the conspiracy world happened. Jezeline Maxwell has been, I don't know if I said her first name right, but she's a fucking scumbag, so I don't care. She's actually been arrested uh, recently, and she is in prison as we speak, or in jail, I should say, awaiting court proceedings or whatnot. Well, I I, I did see that, obviously, but uh, it's, I feel like a lot of people, much like Epstein, were expecting to have this, like, tidal wave of, like, names thrown out who were involved with it. And obviously Epstein killed himself, allegedly, supposedly. <laughs> and uh, this girl, I'm assuming they're expecting her to rat on people. And I've heard w- Prince Andrew's name tossed around a lot. Um, yes, there's a lot of uh, very wealthy, highly connected people who could possibly be named in this investigation by uh, Jesley Maxwell. That's why, actually, I think that we are on uh, her death watch, pretty much, because I do not expect her to make any kind of testimony. Well, maybe this time they'll make sure the cameras are working and she doesn't have <laughs> access to any bed sheets. Yeah, I don't think they're going to pull the same trick twice. I I would actually expect uh, them to claim that she was killed by coronavirus just because of how popular it is right now. I figured you were going to say we're going to see her be assassinated by like Predator or something. No, not not anything <laughs> like that. I expect I expect it to be leaked out in the news that she's in some way sick. And in a couple of weeks, they'll just claim, oh, yep, she died. Sorry. And then you'll just never hear anything about it again. So you want to put a Deadpool on her, correct? Well, I mean, I don't know how many people I could get into it. But if I did, I would probably put my bet on. I was thinking about it. It probably has to be a weekend, uh, August 14th to the 17th. That's when you're, so what is that? A month, month yep. and a week yep, from now? a month from today. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How long oh, did we Epstein also, live? Uh, I have no idea. I think it was about a month. That's why I kind of am going with this date. So we should actually say that we are recording at 537 on July 12th. And she is currently alive, allegedly, still <laughs> in in jail. Yeah. So she so could, if, technically- if this. She could technically be dead by next week is why you're stamping the date. Yes, yes, uh, she could. We are going to, uh, obviously, every Friday we put these up. So by the time Friday comes around, she could be dead by then. So that's kind of why I put the, the time and the date, just to make sure. <clears throat> ah, God, I don't, I feel like she's going to be, this is my opinion. I think because of the whole Epstein thing. I don't I think she might last a little longer, so don't seem too suspicious, but she's not going to talk about anything. So I'm going to give her till September 28th, your birthday. I'm giving her till then. All right. September 28th. We'll yep. have to see. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get we'll get some more people in on this and maybe throw some money down. 
<laughs> get a. I'm pretty have sure. Have to make I, up a whole death pool chart. I'm pretty sure our fans will will get in on this. Maybe we should do the death and the type or the the date of the death and the type of death. Yeah. Oh, that could be fun, actually. I don't know. Prison's pretty <laughs> limited. Maybe I don't know. There's from prison suicides. The ones I've mainly heard of are hanging themselves or they stockpile their antidepressants and then take them all at once to poison themselves to death or whatever. So there's also like cutting themselves too. I've heard if they can get access to those tools. Oh, I'm sure somebody will leave or something <laughs> anyway yeah okay well hit us up on uh subliminal deception on instagram or email us at sub- subliminal deception podcast uh and tell us your date or how long you feel like she's gonna make it and we'll go from there maybe we'll make a little chart or something and don't forget to leave a uh, a five-star review and a little nice comment That'd be perfect. You leave a five-star review on iTunes and then just write the data on there and we'll know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Anyway, Phil, why don't you take the reins here and lead us on an adventure? All right. Mine today deals with something that's kind of near and dear to both of our hearts. A common trope among the creators of religion is not only that their god figure created everything and everyone that ever was, is, or will be, but that humans were there from the very beginning, if not shortly thereafter. Some even creating a story that has the universe created for humans. Now, as ridiculous as that sounds for today's modern world, at the time of the creation of these religions, humans were living in a world full of questions and new levels of self-understanding and sense of self, and these men and women needed ways to explain the mysterious world around them. Okay, I'm following you. In the early religions, everything observed had a god or some kind of spirit controlling this odd function of the universe or of the human condition that needed explaining. Astronomical objects like the Earth, Moon, Sun, stars, and observable planets took on stories that would eventually turn into myth and legend. Hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes, and other natural disasters would also be given simple answers that could easily be passed down to later generations, even if they needed to be tweaked here and there whenever new discoveries were made. Yes, true that. So, however, when these civilizations, in some cases, literally set their mythologies to stone, a problem emerges. That problem being that new discoveries no longer melt in and naturally give slight changes to society and their beliefs a chance. Instead, rather, clashing with the ancient texts passed down from the holy men of old and the people that cling to those beliefs so dearly. In the modern world, we have many generations of scientific discovery and new technologies to observe the universe around us, growing at an almost exponential rate, and these explanations class with the beliefs set by men and women of ancient times. And if you haven't figured it out, today we will discuss one of these clashes, which is creationism. Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. Yeah. This would be so a spicy are, topic. Yeah, a uh, pretty good one. Hoping to get <laughs> some uh, some messages from <laughs> some fans. So there are three types of creationism currently, uh, with many subcategories that fall underneath them. Uh, today we'll be talking about just mainly young Earth creation, uh, but the types are young Earth creation, old Earth creation, and neo-creation. Okay, now where does neo-creation fit in? In between old old Earth and young, uh, young Earth. So I'm going to get into that. Okay. Well, not really the neo-creation. So neo-creation, uh, mainly, if you kind of, it's kind of like the new form of creationism that goes along like perfectly with science. It's kind of like the intelligent design theory. Okay. okay. Which I'll explain much later on in the, in the podcast, but. Okay. Yeah. So young earth creationism uh, is really the hardest to prove among these three types. Uh, It is the belief that the earth is around 6,000 to 10,000 years old. Many young earth creationists believe that the story of Genesis should be taken literally and that God created the earth in six 24 hour period days. So our old friend Paul from Mabe's Pizza uh, was a young earth person 
Yes, he would be considered a young Earth creationist and a uh, hapless bum, drunk, mm. drug addict, among other things. The uh, You know what is ironic, actually? I've been posting those dinosaur conspiracy memes, and mm. someone messaged me and said, do people really think dinosaurs don't exist? And <laughs> And then she was literally like, my crazy fundamentalist family, Christian family, believes that dinosaurs existed, but they li- they they lived with humans about six thousand years ago, and then okay. for, so they were like, I don't know, went extinct <laughs> with it. I don't know when they went extinct if they've been here six thousand years with humans. I don't know. So we're gonna get into that uh, at the end of the episode. Also, okay, so perfect. Save, save that little story for that. <laughs> okay. So these young Earth creationists believe that evidence of this young Earth creation can be found in the Bible itself by using the ages of the great men from the Bible, starting, of course, with Adam and working their way through biblical history to the story of the demigod Jesus and the creation of the Christian sect that broke off of the monotheistic religion of Judaism. It is funny when you really think about Jesus. Technically, he is a demigod. He would be considered the sun god in most religions, being born on September 25th. Um, kind of, it's really taken from a lot of different, like, oral traditions of the past, including, like, Apollo and of Greek religion. Oh, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There's some other ones, uh, ancient Egypt. There's a shit ton around the world. I think you meant December 25th, Phil. What did I say? September 25th. Oh, I meant, yeah, I slipped up my tongue there. December 25th. <laughs> you yeah. know why you got September on your mind? Because that's your birthday and that's the around when Giselle or whatever's going to die. Well, you think so, but I think yeah. it's going to be the middle of August. It's going to be in August. Okay. Yeah. So the the whole Jesus being born on December 25th thing actually lines up the same uh, birthday as Apollo had. It's three days after the winter solstice and... Winter is the sign in the ancient world of death, and once the winter solstice happens, that's when the sun gets lowest in the sky, and on December 25th, after the sun hangs down in the sky at its lowest point for three days, that's when it finally comes up, and that's like the birth, like the new birth of the year, the new birth of the sun. Oh, so you're saying that could be where they got, or that's where Apollo came from. Yeah, that's where all of the... Like most of these uh, sun gods share the birthday September or December 25th for that reason. Okay. All right. Well, just imagine if they were somewhere like goddamn Alaska where the sun doesn't do that. Yeah. It's definitely from the region, you know, uh, like all of the stories of the birth of Jesus. Definitely you have to be in that region to see those things going on with the star, like the heavens. But yeah. Yeah. The biblical patriarchs that are written in the Bible lived a lot longer than modern humans, with Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, and Moses all living for longer than 900 years. You know what? I'm going to be honest with you, Phil. Like, I didn't learn that people actually believe that until maybe like this year when I was talking to a, a, a man of the Muslim faith who informed me about all the prophets and how long they live. Mm. And I was like, what? You think Noah lived like 600 years? Like, what? Why? Like, why did they live that long? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, exactly. They think it's because God blessed them, or they also believe it could be because, I've heard different situations, because the days were longer back then, or shorter, whichever one you want to, I'm I'm not sure if it was longer or shorter, but they claim that because time was different back then, people lived for longer than they do now. I've heard that also. Okay, actually, that does make sense, though, right? Yeah. Like maybe like shorter the, days, less. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they had shorter years, so technically, in their time period, he did live 600 years, which in today's day might be like 32 years old. Could be. That'd be or, an old man in you know whatever. 5000 BC. That's an old man, 32 years old. Oh, yeah. Before modern medicine and uh, all the things that we know now, health wise, definitely 
you could you could like there's a lot of people who just had an accident and something that wouldn't even like stop you like after a trip to the ER would kill them because of infections and all that shit back then. Yeah, can you imagine, Phil? If you and I right now were alive, we were both 34-year-old gentlemen in 5000 BC, whatever, our kids would try would be trying to put us in a retirement home or leave us to die somewhere so they could get all of our gold. I don't think it's it's quite like that. I think that <laughs> once you hit like 35, everyone just kind of starts calling you old man and then eventually you just die of something. I know I th- I think it was Socrates who lived over the age of 60 maybe and they considered him like a very old, old man, like ancient old man. I'm not sure if it was Plato, Socrates or Aristotle. I know it was one of those three, but I know like living that long meant that you were an extremely old person. I guess what I would do is compare old timey ages and the NFL and they correlate with young people and old people. Most people in the NFL are gone by the age of 30, 31. That would be an old person in old timey world. 18 is like a fresh stag or whatever. So (laughs) you're good to go. Well, that's just like Brett Favre at his retirement. He had the old man grayed out. All of his hair was gray. All of his beard was gray. He looked like the old man of the NFL, even though he was like, what, late 30s? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you can just say he's basically the NFL's version of Socrates. You can just tell. You can just say that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So most of the other patriarchs who didn't quite make it to the 900 year mark lived no less than 100 years old with the ages of these patriarchs falling gradually throughout subsequent generations. Now, just like our old buddy said, Paul, first there was Adam and Eve, then came the flood. Yep, yep, I remember this. Yeah, I remember that thinking at the time I was about 15, 16 years old, thinking that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. (laughs) Okay, but in the story, Noah is like five or six generations from Adam, right? So Noah would be 10 generations, ten generations from Adam. Okay, yep, yep. So according to the timeline, Adam and Eve's first son was Seth, born when Adam was about 130 years old. Adam died at the age of 930 years old, which was 126 years before Noah was born, in the year 1056. Wait, what happened to Cain and Abel? Uh, so they, uh, the thing is, the patriarch is the firstborn son. Gotcha. So okay, it it went. Seth was the firstborn son, so it's Adam, then Seth, and then so on for generation after generation. Gotcha. Okay. So Noah was born in 1056, and he was the tenth generation of prophet, with Adam and Seth being one and two respectively. So that's kind of how the generations go. Uh, Noah is the grandson of Methuselah, who is in the eighth generation. Uh, he actually lived the longest of all of the Bible patriarchs. He was born in the biblical year of 687 and died during the start of the Great Floods in the year 1656 at the age of 969 years old. Pretty, just a young spry chicken there. Wait, so Noah didn't even save his, like, what, great, great, great grandfather or whatever? Apparently not. It looks like he died during the year of the Great Flood. I don't know if he actually died because of the flood or if that's just the year he died. Maybe, like I know his arc, you could only have like two people who are 900 plus years old. He, there was no room for him. <laughs> it's just like those doomsday movies. Sorry, anyone who's over 800 years old cannot come on this boat. No, can't do they're just, it. They're just a little too old. They're going to be shitting everywhere more than all these goddamn animals. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, also, Noah's father, Lamech, who was the ninth generation lived to be 777 years old. Okay, not quite as long as uh, the other guy, but still a good life, Uh, I guess. But you got to hear about Noah's uh, fertility here. So Noah has three sons that make up Generation 11. Uh, They were born in about the year 1556. Their names were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah was already around 500 years old when they were born. So... uh... I don't know if you can get, have kids at that age, right? Yeah, I don't know. He must have been blowing out dust at the, <laughs> by 500 years old. He's just, he's just got the most testosterone ever for a man who is 500 plus years old. Oh, yeah. He's just still 
still fucking kicking it, trying to wave down all the young chicks. <laughs> so the family, Noah's family boarded the ark in the biblical year of 1656. And this was when Noah was 600 years old. Okay, so he was that version of a millennial, kind of. Noah, or... Yeah, because he was he was born at the turn of the uh, millennium. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, he's, possibly. He's born oh, okay, in the year that. 1000. He's now in 1600. He's good to go. Yeah, he was born in 1056, so I guess you're kind of right there. <laughs> they, uh... <laughs> yeah. So 1656 is a very important year for young Earth creationists because it is the year that the supposed Great Flood occurred which according to these creationists covered the entire earth in water and set up the conditions for why scientists believe that the earth is billions, not thousands of years old, which they actually believe. So they think that because of the flood, it tricks modern scientists. Yes. I will go into that right okay. now. Okay. So modern science explains that the geological timeline for earth can be explained looking at the strata of rock that make up the layers of the Earth, and that this striation was formed due to billions of years of soil and rock sedimentation laid down on top of each other, with a fossil record contained in these striations made by both animals and plants, which gives us a timeline for the geological history of Earth, when modern scientific techniques are used to date the fossils and rock that are laid down in the layers of sediment. However, some subcategories of young earth creationists believe that Noah's great flood from the Bible laid down these sediments in a very short period of time, and that the plants and animals that make up the fossil record found in these striations was created due to the massive die-off that occurred after the flood, minus of course what Noah and his family took on the ark with them, which now currently makes up all of the life on earth that we see to this day. Okay, so, okay, I I mean, I kind of see what they're saying, because they're assuming all the dead fossils and everything are really, really old, but they're saying they just got wiped out at the same time because of the flood. A little yes, too convenient. Yes. So they're claiming that all of the fossils that we dig up is because all of these animals died at the exact same time, and because of all the floodwaters, all of this sediment was uh, laid down, and even though it looks like these fossils are of animals and plants that died at different times, they're actually dying at the exact same time, just in different layers of the strata. Have they sat and asked themselves why the water dinosaurs are <laughs> as old as the land dinosaur? They haven't probably <laughs> put much thought into any of this except for how to prove their theories I'll well at the at the very end i'll kind of go into why i think they are fighting so hard for this but do you know uh, and kind of the differences between actual science and what they are trying to make up so in all honesty or being completely serious do these people view water world as a actual documentary as a historical documentary yes one of I the mean, greatest of all time look if Noah had to battle smokers and Dennis Hoffman <laughs> to like find dry land and stuff, and Noah had gills and he liked to slap children in the back of the head, Waterworld be a great representation of Noah. That is true. It might actually be. Didn't they find land at the end of that movie? Yeah, they did because yeah, they did. Definitely. For some for some reason, it was tattooed on that little girl's back. I don't know why. For some reason it was tattooed on her back. Was that supposed to be a birthmark or a tattoo? I think it was a tattoo. It was a tattoo? Yeah, no, it was too detailed to be a birthmark. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that movie in quite a while. It uh, it wasn't exactly one of those rewatchable movies that no, was actually a lot, good. A lot of people <laughs> hate it, but to be honest, I like it. But the part that people like keep playing over and over again is where Kevin Costner like, slaps that girl little girl in the back of the head he's like what do you or he's like what are you thinking about or something like that he just fucking whaps her in the back of the head i have seen that meme yeah the, just a little it's like a it's like one of those little short clips where it's just like five little 
clips, it's just Kevin Costner smacker in the back of the head. <laughs> yeah, you can't hit kids like that. No, well, not anymore. But apparently, in the the distant future, in the Walter world, it's fine. Anyway, so I should also. What's that? I was I was just laughing. I was just saying. Anyway, continue on, Phil. Oh, <laughs> so I should also add that the biblical account is not the only great flood myth that came out of the ancient times. Others being the Epic of Gilgamesh from Mesopotamia, Norse and Greek mythology, India, China, and earlier civilizations from all over the earth have great flood. Uh, scenarios in their oral traditions in one way or the other, either to create or reshape the earth. Some even containing their own story of a man escaping these waters by building a boat. Now, he- here's the thing. Are there in other religious texts, are, does it say like they believe that a flood happened or they believe that a flood is going to happen? Uh, the ancient ones, most of the ones I kind of picked through mostly just Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the Norse and the Greek mythology ones. But in those ones, uh, the flood actually did happen. See, Not this, that the flood was going to happen. See, this is where I think it gets really interesting, where multiple cultures and different religions have talk about the same event. I don't think it was necessarily God who flooded the earth, but it could definitely be a natural event that happened that th- they obviously didn't understand back then. Like maybe a big meteor hit the ocean and flooded it or something. You know what I'm saying? Something like that. There is uh I think it's off the coast of Madagascar uh, or at least off the coast of Eastern Africa. There is a, like one of those giant craters where like an impact did occur. And they think that that could be where the flood water, if there was a flood, uh, where the flood water might have come from, uh, causing well, if you have like a huge tsunami caused by a giant meteor, then that definitely could cause floods in the lower land like areas. So you, you know what's really interesting that you mentioned Madagascar and that happening around there. As far as I know, Madagascar has some of the most unique wildlife there that is mm-hmm. con- self-contained to madagascar so if you really think about it it could be plausible that if an asteroid hit there flooded or madagascar maybe is originally connected to africa flooded there and the animals got trapped on that pe- that island of madagascar while everything else was flooded or something makes you think about stuff like that you know what i mean yeah i think madagascar might have been one of those situations where there was a land bridge during the ice ages ah and then and- it got too high and then, yeah, the water the water came back up, and then the land bridge obviously got cut off, and all of those animals that were probably in Madagascar and Africa, I imagine maybe ended up dying off in Africa, but still lived in Madagascar. I just I just think stuff like that's so unique, where you have like specific animals who are kind of like lo- only located on these certain islands somehow. Just it, it's very interesting. Yeah, I always found it interesting. Uh, When you look at, like, in North America, they had, what was it, like, camels, elephants, or not elephants, the like, the mammoths, and all of these, like, really, animals that you really don't think of being in North America were actually in North America, uh, but there was, like, a big die-off around, I think it's 11,000 years ago. Whoa, do you know what you're talking about right now? The Earth is not that old, so I don't oh, know. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't even know what this eleven thousand years ago thing is. I don't even know what yeah, that is. We don't count that high. Couldn't possibly. God only made the Earth uh, six thousand years ago. So, <laughs> so some of the history that goes into uh, young Earth creationism up until nearly the end of the early modern period, which was between about the 16th and the 19th centuries. The belief that the Earth was young was commonly accepted until the creation of modern scientific techniques and studies began pushing back the birth of the Earth, Sun, and Universe to billions of years instead of the previously believed thousands of years. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the old practice of taking up modern thoughts and adding them into old beliefs began to take shape with the creation of old Earth theories, including progressive creationism which was created by Georges Cuvier, who was a French anatomist at the end of the 18th century. Now, Phil, what the hell is an anatomist? 
So uh, I actually looked that one up. An anatomist is someone who studies the structure of organisms and their parts. It's kind of a really old study. Why the hell is he studying religion if he's supposed to be looking at people's innards or uh, <laughs> animals' innards or whatever? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I think he just uh, came up with this theory and ran with it. Can you imagine if you go into a hospital to have, like, let's just say you ha you're having orthopedic surgery because you hurt your knee or something, and all of a sudden your doctor comes out and hands you a pamphlet that says, Old World Creationism. I don't know if I'm going to take him serious. Or if they're just about to put you under for surgery. And then all of a sudden, the main surgeon basically just grabs his people and says, okay, let's have a little prayer before we start. Ah. Just rip out the IV. Nope, 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 nope. Just run out of there. <laughs> yeah, God, that would be... Ugh. I mean, I know surgeons listen to music when they're doing surgery. I might even be wary if they turn on, like, uh, Nickelback or something. I might get out <laughs> of there if they do that. If you wake up from your surgery and you hear your doctor humming Nickelback. Yeah. <laughs> no, doc, sew me back up. <laughs> You're not qualified. Just, fix, just fuck my knee up again so I can go to a different doctor, please. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So Cuvier's idea of progressive creationism was that God created forms of life in bursts and destroyed these groups through catastrophism, repopulating the earth with new groups of life after the destruction of the old. Now, Cuvier's idea was expanded upon by later theorists, including French geologist Marcel de Barras, who theorized that creations became more perfect over time, with others theorizing that this progressive repopulating was all in part of God's plan to eventually seed the planet with humans, his most perfect creation, of course. So basically, they think God is... Essentially like a guy who invented a new sandwich. Like he kept trying over and over and finally he discovered a buffalo chicken wrap or something like that. Like I, what are they talking about? We just kept getting recycled over and over. He's saying basically they started with imperfect organisms and then God just kept destroying those organisms and working his way back up. Okay. Until you eventually came on, you know, better animals, plants, and eventually making your way to humans. So essentially what we're what they're saying here is God started off with a vinyl record. Then he destroyed that <laughs> and he created an eight track. Then he destroyed that. Then he he made a uh, uh cassette tape. He destroyed that. Then he made a CD. He destroyed that. Then he made Napster. He destroyed that. And now he has made iTunes. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, and exactly. Metallica, yeah, actually, and Metallica, who sued Napster, is technically Satan, and now Metallica Satan. Yeah. is Satan, who is trying to destroy God's latest creation of iTunes. Perfect analogy. Possibly. Perfect. Yeah, that analogy. is actually 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 that's a pretty good analogy. <laughs> so modern progressive creationists. Modern progressive creationism states that God created different plants and animals in bursts over millions of years, starting with simple single-celled organisms and gradually created progressive forms of life in groups over the course of those millions of years. And they do not believe at all that these forms of life evolved from each other. So really, they do not believe in evolution. That's mm. kind of one of their big tenets. This That is like the most roundabout way to say, okay, the Earth's a little older, but there's no way evolution exists. Yeah, even giving up the fact that, okay, 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 animals did change over time, <laughs> but not because of evolution. It's because, you know, Big Christ, Big JC and his old, uh, his old pops, they're the ones who did it all. Well, I mean, technically in their belief is only God did that, not Jesus, right? Oh well, I mean, yeah, uh, I'm just saying. I like yeah, I, yeah. I like saying JC. Yeah, it, it it is fun. Yeah. So in a backlash to modern scientific theory and the forms of old Earth creationists, young Earth creationism was created to combat these new theories at the start of the 20th century, and they were to combat really the moving away from the belief that God created the universe and that the Bible could be incorrect in any way. As we all know, religious belief is 
essentially a house of cards. And once you start chipping away at the Bible, things start to fall apart pretty quick. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would recommend anybody out there, if you if you grew up religious, Christian, whatever, um, and you're kind of curious about what you were actually reading when you were a young person, check out It's a Bible podcast and yeah. listen to them reading stories about the Bible. And you're going to, I mean, I was sitting there being like, what the fuck are they talking about? Like, it's literally what I was thinking when they were telling the stories from the Bible. Yeah, that's one of my uh, hanging out at home, like cleaning the apartment on the weekends podcast. They actually haven't had a new one in a few weeks now, but hopefully they come back around with that. But I'm just saying, even regardless of when they've uploaded last, like all the episodes before that, it's just, it feels like you're reading a Dr. Seuss novel. Yeah. Oh, especially they were uh, just finishing up with Genesis. So it was a lot of uh, a lot of old, old uh, ancient stories. <sighs> pretty yeah. pretty much about the patriarchs I was talking about before. Mm, you're right. I was going to say, too, there's a, a really good quote that I read uh, when I was doing my research. And uh, I didn't write it down, but I just remembered it. Uh, if belief was a glass of water, one gulp can turn you into an atheist. But religion is always at the bottom of the glass. And the glass never empties. There's something like that. Yeah. And it got me thinking about that. You know what's funny, actually, about this old world creationism? So uh, quite a while ago, I, w I wanted to do research on the, uh, basically, they call them, call them like the bone hunters, but they're like the uh, dinosaur people, like the two hmm. main ones who discovered e the dinosaurs and kind of named them and started a feud and all of that. In the book... They were talking about like, I think it was like late 1700s, early 1800s religious beliefs mixing mm -hmm. with science. And it was just it was fascinating. Like they leaned really heavily on like plant plants and God mixed together kind of. And it was uh, it's pretty fascinating to watch the evolution of that. Yeah, uh, I think in one of our older episodes, we talked about it, but there was the the naturalist who figured out that birds were descended from dinosaurs by looking at like his dinner. He was eating quail or something like that. And he figured out that the dinosaur bones that he was researching were a lot like bird bones. So mm. I've in history class, I've learned about that a few different times. It's pretty interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So uh, I told you before that we were going to talk about neo-creationists a little bit. Uh, you've heard of intelligent design, correct? I have. So another form of modern creationism uh, melds together science and religion. And this is the theory of intelligent design, which claims that the complexity of life and the universe itself is far too advanced to have occurred by natural means, and that the creation of all life is not just happenstance. Intelligent design came out of the end of the legality of uh, teaching creationism in public schools. This happened in the 1980s when that all ended. Uh, intelligent design was created in the 90s as a way to bridge modern science and religion. And this, of course, is a way to get religion back taught in public schools. Well, the first time I heard about intelligent design, it sounded like it was almost like a college philosophical study of it kind of does that make sense i don't know if you've you ever took it or not um i've heard about intelligent design uh, mostly just from reading about it and watching documentaries and that kind of stuff i've never actually taken a class where i was taught intelligent design like in college well i i think it was more of a like abstract look at the belief system of it but uh i mm -hmm. i think nick my friend Nick took it when he was in college, I believe. Sounded yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's pretty weird. Was it like a religion class or was it the whole class? No, I think it was the whole class. But I, what I'm saying is it might be a, a religious class, but it's like a study of that religion belief. Oh, a study of like intelligent design theory. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I've never really taken a class like that. Um, I have heard that intelligent design like the teaching of it was before doing this research i have heard that it was created in order to get religion back into public schools i i guess it makes sense 
Yeah. So the best arguments for young earth creation that I found while doing my research were from an article by Jeff Miller. Now these articles came from 21 reasons to believe the earth is young by Jeff Miller. I also found another article that was titled critical analysis of article 21 reasons to believe the earth is young by Jeff Miller. So that was pretty, pretty Wait, lucky to find those. Ho- hold on. So he wrote an article, then he wrote another article criticizing his own article. No, I was just about to say authored by Lawrence G. Collins and oh. Ken Wogglemuth. He didn't write the he didn't write the critical analysis. No. Analysis. I was gonna say, what is going on here? That's <laughs> like double dipping. I was like, that'd be like you and I doing a review podcast about our own podcast. Talking about how full of shit we are. Yeah. It's like, I think these two guys are fucking assholes who don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that'd be if we were making uh, any sort of money off of this, that'd be a good way to double dip. Hell yeah. Just make a podcast and then immediately put out a podcast about how we're full of shit. <laughs> that'd, that'd be, be amazing. Honestly, that'd be amazing. Yeah, definitely. So I'm not actually going to go through all 21 points in detail. Uh, that would take us forever. But there were a few of my favorites, and I'll mention some of the rest uh, towards the end. Uh, the first one I'm going to mention is the Bible. Now that's his reason. Yeah, that's number. That's reason numero uno is the Bible. And I'm citing him in the article quote: "If the Bible is the inspired word of God, then whatever it teaches can be known to be true, including what it teaches about the age of the earth. The evidence indicates that the Bible is in fact God's word." Now. Using Genesis, he claims that we can decipher the age of the earth by means of calculating the age of the patriarchs, which I went into at the beginning of the episode. Mm. So obviously, I'm not really going to read the rebuttal, uh, but there's obvious, it's just kind of self-explanatory Yeah, why it's easily rebutted. But <laughs> I was just going to say, if you were to commit a crime, let's say we did like a... Uh... Point break robbery of a bank, right? We get yep. caught. Cops ask us why we did it. And we just stand there and say, the Bible. What do you think <laughs> they would say? Probably uh, might lock us up and have a little uh, mental evaluation. <laughs> I could also say for that, if we committed a crime, got caught, and then they asked us why we committed this crime, and then we just came back and said, we didn't commit the crime because we said we didn't commit the crime. <laughs> Case closed. That's it. <laughs> Oh, we didn't commit the crime. It was God's plan. Sorry. All right. You're acquitted. See you later. No. Oh, handcuffs off. Thank you. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to hire a lawyer for both of us. If we ever get in legal trouble, all he's going to do is print off this article from Mr. Miller and read it in our defense. That's all he's going to do. Get us out of everything. No, no. It's the Bible. It's fine. (laughs) So uh, another point that he makes is about human population. Now, Miller claims that if humans have been around for millions of years, like scientists claim, then the population of humans on Earth would be enormous and not sustainable. He claims that, quote, assuming humans have been on the planet for only one million years rather than the two or three million years, we find that there would be 10 to the 2,000th people on the planet today. There are, however not even 10 to the 10 people on earth at this point. In fact, if three foot tall humans with narrow shoulders were squeezed into the universe like sardines, only 10 to the 82nd people would fit into the entire universe. It would take 10 to the 19, 18 minus one other universes like ours to house that many humans. Did this man just pretend to do math? I think so. Yeah. I don't exactly know where he came up with the calculations. Uh, Basically, in the rebuttal, the two authors talk about how dimwitted these math equations are. But let me go into that. What's that? I was going to say absolutely. I mean, to be honest, what it sounds like now, and since we might get hate mail anyway, I might as well add to the top of it. Um. (laughs) It reminds me of Ben Shapiro, right? What yeah. he does is, say, is says a lot of big, complicated words to make himself sound more intelligent than he actually is. 
and then it confuses mm-hmm. people and then thinks they assume he, they know he knows what he's talking about all the time. Um, I don't get me wrong. He's probably correct some of the time, but it's like the art of confusion. And essentially that's what this guy's trying to do is sound overly intelligent to then confuse people who are reading it. Yeah, I really liked Ben Shapiro's, uh, like all the YouTube videos and all of the debates that I saw him in uh, for a little bit. And he, I, I will say, I do believe he's a very intelligent person. However, you start to watch his debates and you realize that he has these these statements that are kind of queued up in his head that he's memorized. And he just spits them out so fast. And he's also really good at using those little prepared statements to counter anything that the other person says. He also speaks very quickly and he speaks over people. Like if anyone else takes like a tiny little break, he'll just jam in there and start talking. All of a sudden, it's not the other person's turn to talk anymore. So you kind of realize you're watching the same debate over and over again because he really keeps saying the same things. That's, I do think that he's really intelligent, though. No, I, I'm i not taking away from his intelligence, but it's a – and it's probably not just him. There's pl- probably plenty of people who do this. But it's like a trickery form where you talk really fast and talk really uh, articulate and it kind of like tricks them, tricks you into like making you sound like you know what you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a really good form of like winning a debate just to completely avalanche the other person with all of these, like all of the quick words that he's saying and all of the ideas and all of a sudden you're talking about one thing and then he switches it to something else and you're just dazzled, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that this Mr. Miller and his stuff, I think where he fucked up was he used fractions and that slows people down. Don't use fractions. Use prime numbers or something. You got to keep them. You got to keep it quick. Use fractions. Yeah. People are going to stop and think about it and then think about what you're saying and realize you're, I, they, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, The thing about it is 10 to the 2,000th power is such a gigantic number. You can't even – I think that's what he was doing with using these huge numbers is really trying to just make your brain explode. Like, oh, that's got to be right because he used such big numbers, you know? I guess this guy doesn't realize that in primitive days, wasn't really medicine and stuff. So you would die from everything. Yeah, that's uh, that's funny. That's exactly what they go into in the rebuttal. Yeah. So the rebuttal gives the rebuttal given for uh, the critical analysis for the human population explosion uh, is only because of food and medicine production of the modern era, and that the total human population on Earth was only about 1.5 billion in the early 1800s. Miller also claims that with all of those dead humans we should see billions upon billions of hominid fossils in the scientific record, though we've only found enough to fill a single coffin. And the rebuttal for that is that given how hard it is and the special conditions that you need for a fossil to be created, and the fact that bones are scattered before they can be fossilized, uh, that is the reason why we don't find all of these fossils from early hominids and modern humans. Well, I mean, ba- I mean, I don't know what burial rituals look like a long time ago, but if you're not buried deep enough, your body is going to get carried away by a, a wild animal. It's just oh, what's going to happen, yeah. especially bones and, and everything. They're going to run off with them. And unless you're buried in, I think it's if you're if you die in like peat moss or like a swamp, then your body can be fossilized. But if you don't get buried in a situation where there's water around, eventually your body will just decay into nothing anyway. Not every person who's buried gets fossilized. Yeah, exactly. There's a special, there's very special conditions it takes to be fossilized, but he's making it seem in his argument that everything that dies gets fossilized. (sighs) Well, I mean, he's kind of just like throwing everything that he can at the wall. Basically, yeah. So another one of his points is humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time. We were talking about that before. Now in this, Miller argues against dinosaurs living millions of years ago and claims that evidence has been found in historical and geological records for cohabitation of humans and dinosaurs. Now he gives these examples 
from his 26 citation, which I tracked down, uh, was Eric Lyons and Kyle Butt in 2008 wrote The Dinosaur Delusion. And this was from the Apologetics Press out of Montgomery, Alabama. So he doesn't really give any examples in his articles. They're all in this citation that he uses. But his examples for this are a relief of a stegosaurus in a rock column that was found in Cambodia, an apatosaurus uh, that was found in southern Utah. It was a like a cave drawing and a dinosaur carving in northern Arizona with claims that dinosaur tracks have also been found in that area. You know what is ironic, actually, about him saying this is on Reddit, it was literally today, I think, they had a picture of what they believe are dinosaur footprints that are like basically humongous, I don't know, fuck, it looked like a humongous circle, basically, impressed in the dirt. Or not in the dirt, but maybe it's like some sort of uh, rock or something. So it's funny that you bring that up. Or that these people are talking about that. Yeah, so um, actually, if you actually look at these articles, like the 21 Reasons articles that I'm going through right now, look up the 26 citation and go like trace it back to this article from Eric Lyons and Kyle Butt, uh, The Dinosaur Delusion. It's pretty compelling because it was like, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of years ago when these reliefs were made in the stone columns. But it does look a lot like a stegosaurus. Like it's pretty, it's pretty odd. It's almost as if they maybe found a fossil of a stegosaurus and then didn't quite know what it was, but drew what they thought it might have looked like as an animal. It's kind of like if you ask a kindergartner to draw you what they think a stegosaurus looks like. That's exactly what's in the relief of this stone column. It's pretty interesting. Huh. Okay. That is interesting. I might have to. Take a look at that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, when I put it on Instagram, I'm actually going to put those pictures up. Oh, so, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'll try to remember to do that this time. I think the last time I said that I didn't do it. But uh, so he quotes in the article, sure enough, physical, historical, and biblical evidence are available to substantiate the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs in the recent past. And the rebuttal for this is, that dinosaur and human fossils have never been found in the same fossil record, and that human and dinosaur fossilized tracks have never been found together. So kind of what you were talking about before, how they found fossilized dinosaur tracks, they've never been found with human tracks. Yeah, that, that that's a very good point. Man, I don't know what I... I assume the footprints are something, what we would think about a, uh, like a brontosaurus, where it's just like two, like four tree trunks walking, basically. And they're <laughs> yeah. just these humongous fucking like circular footprints. It's insane to look at, like the scope of how big their foot was. But uh, but yeah, I don't I mean, I guess I really don't know how they know technically those are dinosaur footprints, but uh, it's fucking fascinating. Yeah, from everything that I've learned about, like the creation of fossils from like documentaries and classes that I've taken when you see like footprints, like fossilized footprints, I think it has to do with um, like walking on an area that's like right by the ocean. There was fossilized footprints of what they think were a man and a woman uh, from the sizes of the feet walking next to each other. And they claim that at the time period that these like early humans were walking on this land, that it was a beach. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see. Having a little date. Ah. <laughs> so even ancient cavemen took their lady to the beach to try to get lucky. Yep, possibly. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't doubt it at all. So some of the other arguments from Miller are that, and I'm just going to kind of fire these off a little quicker. Comets only survive about 10,000 years, and that they all, all would have died out by now had the universe and the creation of the solar system been billions of years old. Rebuttal for this is that the Kuiper belt exists outside of the large gas giant planets and that these comets are constantly being refreshed by um, like the jostling of these comets out of the Kuiper belt. Huh. Okay. How did he come to the 10,000 year old thing? Well, the thing is when a comet crosses 
into like where the sun is, uh, into the inner solar system. And you know how when a comet uh, comes around the sun, it has those clouds or the the jets. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So they actually melt. It's like an ice cube melting. And every time a comet comes around, depending on how many times it comes across the sun and how close it gets, it it dies a little bit. So it might die quicker if it's a comet that comes closer to the sun and has made a bunch of like passes rather than one that has a really long trail around the sun and doesn't pass quite as near where the sun is. Okay, okay, that makes sense. I I see what you're saying. But of the comets that come in the sol- the inner solar system, the they last about 10,000 years. But oh. out in the Kuiper belt, they can survive forever because they're not coming close to the sun. They're not getting hot enough. Okay. Okay. Yep, they're out way in the, you know, basically Kuiper belt is where Pluto is. So, it's that far out. Okay. Okay, makes sense. Which Pluto is also a Kuiper belt object, but a lot of people don't believe that either. But we're just going to soak up all the hate mail we can. So some other arguments from Miller. The sun was 25% as hot as it is today when the Earth is formed. But the Earth was hot at that time. And he claims that there's no way that if the sun was 25% as hot as it is today, that the Earth could have been hot. The rebuttal is that there is actually a theory that the Earth was a snow globe until volcanoes started erupting. Really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Apparently, the Earth, back when it first started, was extremely cold. And then all of the like plate tectonics started. And kind of like a like another molten lava Earth um, formed. And that's also when life started up, was... With all of the stew of the water and the lava, and I'm, I don't really know much about it, but before, okay. in between creation and that phase, they think that Earth might have been like a snow globe, like completely covered in ice. Hmm. I wonder if uh, Vanna White will ever tell us what life was like back then. <laughs> Possibly. Maybe Barry <laughs> Satira will give us a ride on his time machine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He only uses that for evil. Mm -hmm. So lunar recession rate is also one of the claims. Uh, He claims that the moon would have been touching the Earth 1.5 billion years ago if you turn back the clock on the lunar recession rate. And basically, the moon moves away from the Earth a little bit every single year. He's claiming that if you take that recession rate back 1.5 billion years ago, the Earth and the moon would have collided. Now, the rebuttal for this is that the moon never touched the Earth because of how it was formed and that the starting distance began when the collision residue first coalesced. Uh, Back from our hollow moon episode, we were talking about how the moon was created and the planet about the size of Mars ran into the Earth and created the moon. Do you remember that? Yeah, and it kind of got stuck there. Yeah, so it, it skimmed it hit the earth in a gray, like it grazed the earth and pushed off all of this debris that formed the moon. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of what I, I, I thought the, uh, the belief was basically what you just said that it had slowly gained mass over time. Yeah. All of that, um, whatever the moon is made out of Jeez. came together. It was like, it was almost like one of Saturn's rings for a while around the earth and then it formed together. Okay. Kind of like the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I don't follow you, but I don't either. I just said. Is that, that because they're the ultimate evil? They they just kind of formed over time. Well, essentially, a bunch of hill hillbillies coalesced at Lambeau Field, and then you have a football team. <laughs> All of a sudden, football just started to be playing in yeah. that spot. See, it's how it happens. Anyway, yeah, it's uh very interesting. I guess technically, if we're all things fair. Neither of the sides can technically prove their point for for the, the moon Packers thing. being an evil organization or well that too. But I'm saying the moon <laughs> theory. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they actually do have models where they figured out that a planet hitting the Earth does create uh, the moon. Um, but but they I mean, that's know- that's just a model they've yeah, created. Yeah, I was just saying they don't know. Technically, that's exactly what happened. No, yeah. But anyway, 
So I'm not going to discuss, like I mentioned, all 21 of the arguments from Miller for time purposes. Some of the others, though, include ocean sediment levels, the amount of salt in the ocean, helium in the atmosphere, and there are uh, quite a few others. But if you would like to read them all, you just have to Google 21 Reasons to Believe the Earth is Young by Jeff Miller. And also make sure right below it, you'll find the rebuttal. Uh, also open up that and read their rebuttals too. It's uh, it, I mean, it sounds like a very interesting article. Yeah, it, it was a pretty interesting article. The reason why I chose that one is because even though all of the points are kind of ridiculous, it was probably the best uh not only theories, but it was put the best. It's I'm not exactly sure who are the main like proponents of like this belief system and who's putting the stuff out there, but I couldn't really find that good of articles for like points on what they actually believe. That's what that's kind of why I use this, and it also came with the rebuttal, which was really helpful. So <clears throat> I'm guessing at at now that we're kind of at the end here. Are you yep. kind of leaning on whether there's any validity to any of these beliefs? I mean, obviously, young Earth creation, there's it's no, it's not. I don't even I'm not even 100 percent sure that they believe because they don't really use scientific method uh, to prove their theories. What they do is they take what scientists believe. They cherry pick certain things and then kind of make something out of that. They're not really doing their own kind of research on any of this stuff. I or mean, they're doing research, but they're not doing their own tests. They're not really using science um, from themselves. I mean, that's kind of like, I don't, and that's just what people do if we're being real here. They yeah, cherry pick what they it, like. It's a pseudoscience. Yeah. It's not a real science. Um, the thing about with the neo-creationists, and like the progressive creationism is, if you wanted to believe in that, I could I couldn't argue with you because you're using like what the scientists are coming up with, but you're just say or not not the progressive creation because they don't say evolution's real. With the intelligent design, they're not really disputing anything that science has to say. They're just adding in God. Which once someone starts talking about like what they believe in for God and not disputing any evidence or empirical evidence for the science, then you can't really say it's wrong because it's their belief. So, right. Right. Yeah. I, I've been kind of thinking about this and this is strictly my belief system here. Um, it might sound like Phil and I are, well, I'm just going to say, I'm going to speak for myself here. It might sound like we're ripping, uh, these belief systems, but I, in all honesty, I don't really care what you believe, but the thing is, and this goes for all religions, is um, you can't really prove them right and you can't really prove them wrong. And then you have someone like Jeff Miller, who is he he's not comfortable enough to just believe his own set of beliefs, whatever they are, the 21 reasons. Instead, he's trying to create a I got you, you're wrong scenario, which then creates the atheist rebuttal people. And this is how you get religious arguments. So if both sides here could just be comfortable with whatever their own beliefs are and not trying to prove somebody wrong or whatever, then they could live happily about it. But unfortunately, then you get things like us discussing this on the podcast where these beliefs are trying to claim that they're the one right belief and everybody else is wrong, which kind of is a problem. Yeah, my only, like, I have no, kind of what you're saying, I have no problem with what people believe or what they want to teach their own children. My real problem is when you start trying to force your beliefs about your God and putting it into public schools, even though yeah. public schools really should be secular. Yeah. Once they try to put those beliefs into public schools, forcing other people's kids to believe that, that's where I'd have a problem with it. I mean, in a private school where... You can choose to go there or choose to send your kids there if you want to send your kids there. That's fine. Whatever. You're paying for it. But in a public school, I definitely don't think there's any room for that. Absolutely. Because essentially, you teaching it in a public school, what you are saying is that we're right. You need to learn this. And there's yeah. no other, nothing in between that. And that is not helpful to anybody. Uh, 
honestly, I feel like most of the people who, especially our generation, religions forced on them, then you get the rebel phase where they're lashing back against it, and then you create people like Phil and I. So <laughs> it's kind and then of eventually like a, they just shed the whole thing and just move on with their lives. Yeah, get it, decent jobs and <laughs> it's find kind of, themselves in the in their life. It, it's just kind of how that uh, world works. But uh, but Phil, man, this was fascinating. I was kind of familiar with all of them. Uh, obviously, we know we knew an old world person personally, but he was kind of using it as a crutch for his personal demons. In the form of alcohol addiction, uh, we, which, which he failed him in the end. But uh, I hope he's okay <laughs> now. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know where he is, but hopefully he's imagine, conquered that. I imagine he's dead now. But I was. I think we should say that uh, our our old friend Paul was living in a halfway house at the time. And I'm pretty sure that these views were forced on him. Just he was going along just to get along. I don't. Well, I, I don't know if he believed that stuff before he moved into that halfway house. No, I probably not. And I'm I'm going to say I could be completely wrong, but it seems like when you are in the pits of despair, religion gives you a purpose and helps you get out of whatever bad scenario you're in, which I guess we can't really mock it for that, right? No, not really. I mean, if it helps you out, that's great. It helps you out. Just, you know, don't try and preach to a bunch of 16 year old kids who are just at some fucking shitty minimum wage job. Yeah, exactly. I mean, by that point, he didn't understand that you and I had had ugh, how many years of hardcore indoctrination in Catholicism. So I think no bullshit a mile I, away. I actually think he even said Catholicism might be a little too extreme for him. <laughs> I think he did say that. I think he did, but, uh, Anyway, Paul, we hope you're still out there somewhere. I don't know what happened. You just disappeared and Phil and I moved away. But uh, anyway, Phil, if anybody wants to send us their appreciation or hate mail, where can they do that? All hate mail can be sent straight to subliminaldpodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Instagram at subliminaldeceptionpodcast on IG. Uh, Been hearing from a lot of people lately, gotten a lot of likes and a lot of comments. So keep them coming. We're grateful to hear from you guys. Uh, Cody and I both have our own Instagram. Mine's sdpodphil. Uh, I checked it actually this past weekend, and I had a bunch of messages that I didn't realize uh, for about a month now. So sorry about that. Cody, <laughs> what's yours? Yeah, uh, hit me up. Follow me on Instagram at Cody Zabub. Uh, talk about whatever you'd like. You can see my trolling instagram stories of crazy people those are always my favorite um otherwise if you would take a few seconds out of your day log on to itunes leave the show five star review just write whatever you want write your prediction for the uh alleged suicide of epstein's little wife i guess i don't know what you want to call her um otherwise if you're a spotify user just hit the follow button and you always be up updated when we drop a new episode otherwise phil Excellent job today. I think people are really going to appreciate and kind of take a outside look at some of these belief systems. Um, otherwise, we will see you guys next week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>